time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. We have an exciting show for you today um, because a lot of the friends is going to uh, recognize the subject and the person that I'm talking about. However, there is a second part to the show which is going to be done by Lengvo. Um, it'll take us to a ser more serious side of what it is we do as members of humanity. And that part will be bilingual, Spanish and English, and we will have an interpreter uh, for that purpose. Um, being born intuitive sometimes carries a heavy load, and then, uh, then when we realize there's others like us, that's a wonderful thing. So this is dedicated to all the friends that uh, finally figured out that um, they have gifts and it is okay to come out and speak up now because uh, the world is kind of ready for you. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce my guest, Alia Leyland, to you. And I hope I pronounced that right. You did. I did. You, did. I, I, you wouldn't believe how I mutilate people's names. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes we make up names for that reason. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I usually ask the guests how they met me. But if you remember, you can tell it. If not, but because we meet hundreds of people, if you don't remember, I'm not going to get upset. Um, I, you sort of alluded to it earlier today mm -hmm. when we were talking, and it's kind of interesting because I didn't remember that meeting with you. You were saying that we met in Chehalis. Chehalis, Washington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the meeting that I remembered mm -hmm. meeting you was um, evidently much after that mm -hmm. uh, when you were telling me, you came to me and you were telling me that you had gotten a motorhome and that you were getting ready to go on an extended trip. Ah, that's when I remembered meeting you. Yeah, so now I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell you the real story. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I alluded in the introduction here, sometimes when we do realize that it's time to come out of the closet mm -hmm. and, uh, and then be thrown into this environment that's somewhat foreign and spooky, you know. And uh, I had been asked to come to a psychic fair in Chehalis, Washington. And that's a little south uh, of Olympia. Um, by a gentleman named Agba. He had a yes, store there. Yes, I remember there. him. Mm -hmm. And I did a show there. That's right. Yeah. And you was the first person that came and greeted me. And you made all the difference in my path from then on. Wow. Wow, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and it was also a layer that uh, travels in a motorhome. And uh, you drive all the way to Alaska. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I took a, um, I have a different motorhome now, but I took a mm -hmm. small... Um, Toyota. Yes, Toyota... Yeah. Um, 20 foot mm -hmm. rig uh, from the northern uh, northwest border all the way to Fairbanks, Alaska, actually Circle Hot Springs, mm -hmm. Alaska, and, right. uh, and back. Yeah. And I didn't get but one flat tire and no broken windows. No broken windows. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? And so I said, oh my, what a way to travel. Yeah. And I said, do you want to sell it? And at that time, you said, no. no. <laughs> And that's sort of how the, the Cropper idea came about. The Cropper is my RV. That right. Sometimes we're neighbors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then the, the, uh, the long story, I'm not going to tell the friends, they already know it, how the Cropper came about, but it was because of you that this whole thing uh, became a thought form. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that I'm glad I was, I was instrumental in that. You've, mm -hmm. done, you've done quite wonderful things with the Cropper. Yeah, I yeah. have. It's sort yeah. of an icon. And... Uh, Sort of famous everywhere except Olympia, but we have found a new home. The tea leaf too was nice enough to give it a permanent home. There's a restaurant. Oh, nice. Because my landlord still hasn't had the epiphany he needs <laughs> to, to let me park Sometimes it where that I happens. I'm, I'm real fortunate. Um, my Toyota grew up and it became an Airstream. That's right. I, <laughs> I watered it and it grew and it became mm -hmm. an Airstream. And um, I now tow a car. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I'm, but I've been very lucky. I, this past winter, um, mm -hmm. I was parked on land that is absolutely pristine. It's 144 acres that's dedicated to spiritual use. Oh, my. Um, only. And mm -hmm. it's in Arizona, which we'll be talking about later mm -hmm. on in the show. But um, the, the woman that was uh, instrumental in, in creating that group is the one who owns that 144 acres. So Spirit sort of led me there and, and put me where I needed to be for that. Yeah, that's the wonderful thing. So when we, when we way out there in the middle of nowhere in an RV and people oh, say, "Aren't wonderful. you worried about no. it?" No, really <laughs> not at all. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. yeah, not at all. It is, it's, it's just wonderful. Now, uh, when I met you, one the first thing I remember about you, and I always tell people that you do readings mm -hmm. with stones, and then you turn them into jewelry. Yes. Um, 
so and he also wrote this book here. I'm gonna I'm gonna show this to the friends. And in the back here, it gives a a basic background of who you are. But I'm gonna let you tell it while I show off your little book here. Okay. Um, it's not really big, uh, not really little. It has a lot of big information. In it. Yes, but mm -hmm. I made it that size specifically mm -hmm. so that um, people could carry it in their purse mm -hmm. or that it would fit in a man's shirt pocket. Mm -hmm so that they would ah. be able to have it with them and use it as a mm -hmm. reference, a feel reference, so, mm -hmm. so to speak, so that if they were out shopping or whatever, they could look up a stone and That's see right. what it meant. Mm -hmm. And each page is dedicated to a, you know, to a stone, mm -hmm. one whole page. So they get the general, the emotional, and the physical application of that stone mm -hmm. without having to read through several paragraphs and flipping yeah. pages and all of that. Um, my background is my mother was a, a shaman and a healer, mm -hmm. and so I learned from her, and she learned from her mom, and and back through the yeah. matriarchal line of our family. And at first, it was an oral tradition; it was passed down mm -hmm. from mother to oldest daughter, and then in 1865, um, it became written. Mm -hmm. And so, from 1865 forward, um, notes were added each with each person that got the information. And I have written notes, and that's what that book is based on. Yeah. You know, um, I come from a long line of uh, intuitive people also. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's incredible how, you know, it goes from, like you say, from the ancestors. My mother told it to me from 1300 on, but of course I can't remember, you know. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it's people, people like us have been put here for a long time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you were always aware that was your calling or did you fight it like all the rest of us? Um, I argued with it. I mean, mm -hmm. my mother was running off, you know, birthing babies and setting bones mm -hmm. and whatnot when I was just really tiny. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it was interesting, but it wasn't something that I wanted to mm -hmm. do. But my job was to take the stones after she finished using them mm -hmm. and cleanse them. Um, take mm -hmm. them to the, the river or take them to the, the, um, the stream, make sure that they were all cleansed and put back mm -hmm. into her bag and into her healing room for the next client or mm -hmm. the next patient. And um, that was all well and good, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. But they were watching me because I was born, uh, there's an old wives' tale about being born in a veil. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was born in a veil. Mm -hmm. So they were watching me from infancy, mm -hmm. waiting for something to come forth from that. Yeah. And, um, you know, watching for me to say mm -hmm. something weird or do something weird, which I, you know, readily accommodated mm -hmm. them. And so I was encouraged. My, my mm -hmm. psychic ability was encouraged from the time that I was really small. We have a mutual friend, Kanashiba Shan. Yes, uh, yes. And we explained what um, being born with a whale means. Yes. So just yes. to remind the friends. Mm -hmm. um, oh, to tell, let them know what it means? Um, yeah, but you can refresh their memory. Oh, okay. She, like. they, she's already told them. Oh, that, but let's refresh their memory. Um, in my understanding, it's being born in the... Um, the umbilical sac, sac. yeah, mm -hmm. and some people are born with it just over their face, right. and some are born in totally inside of the sac. I was yeah. totally inside of the sac, mm -hmm. um, and so it's this means usually that the child will have unusual abilities of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, as it turned out, I'm clairvoyant, clairaudient, mm -hmm. and clairsentient. That's right. Yeah. Well, I, I guess we would have to uh, develop senses if we can see where we go. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, we, we did another show about um, when people are born, you know, so if you don't see where you're going, wow, you need that exactly. on, on top of that. Yeah. And so you chose stones. and um, Yeah, I do readings using stones, and I also, um, <coughs> usually the readings are done for with over 200 gemstones, mm -hmm. um, sometimes as high as 400, and a person has a very short period of time to sit with me and pick out a number of stones, mm -hmm. and then I give them a reading based on the stones they picked out. Because your body, our body is a crystal, mm -hmm. and so your body will attract you to the stone that will balance its energy. Mm -hmm. And we work with crystals in two different ways. We work with them um, energetically, which is the crystallog crystallology mm -hmm. of my work, but we also work with them um, physiologically mm -hmm. and that's the ethnomedical application of my work mm -hmm. so when I create a piece of jewelry it's created so that it works with the person's energy body mm -hmm. but it also is created to touch their skin so that their ethnomedical um, benefits are, are reached as well yeah the only thing I know about that is I'm Scorpio and Malachites and myself go well together evidently mm, okay yeah. now I don't do very much with the stones as far as how they apply to birth signs mm -hmm. um, 
I've, I've heard some of the information mm -hmm. about that, but I'm not real familiar with how they apply to birthstones. Uh, the way that I work with them is more what you're attracted to. Because sometimes um, you, your birthstone will shift. You know, what you're attracted mm -hmm. to will shift, but your birthstone always stays the same. So oh, that's yeah, the that's reason. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because as you grow, you become different. You become a new person, mm -hmm. a different person. Each experience you know, creates more, mm -hmm. um, more of you. And so I have, that's why I have people sit and pick out stones. A prime example of that mm -hmm. is um, people who are pre-diabetic um, or who have blood sugar irregularities will be really attracted to amethyst. They just love amethyst. They pick it oh up my. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as they become insulin dependent, they no longer like amethyst. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, because your body has decided mm -hmm. that before that, it's, it's like pushing you to amethyst because amethyst helps to regulate mm -hmm. blood sugar levels and it, helps to, it will help to heal the pancreas, which is what you know, helps to regulate blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. But once your body is being given insulin, then the pancreas is no longer trying to work, so you don't need it anymore. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Yeah, your body knows exactly what it needs. Yeah, so now for the friend in Anchorage, uh, a layer gets up your way sometimes, so you make sure you make time available to go see her because uh, it's a long way to drive to Alaska. <laughs> it is a long way to drive to Alaska, but if people want to know where I am, mm -hmm. that my telephone number, if they call that number, it's a cell mm -hmm. phone. So it will list where I am. And you, you have a wonderful web page. Yes. And so you can sort of keep track of her, uh, you know, and we'll probably get back to that at the end of the show somewhere. Um, and I, I don't know if you have children or not, do you? No children. No children. My rocks are my children. Your children, yeah. <laughs> my rocks are my children. My motorhome is my child. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, people tell me that I'm, I'm very nurturing. I don't feel like I am. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm just me. But I've been told that my energy is rather nurturing. I, I enjoy mm -hmm. people and I enjoy assisting them. But a child is a big responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. And um, I just, it's not one that I, I felt that I needed to do. I have, I have children and I also have grandchildren mm -hmm. and um, I, I believe that sometimes when we go to these evolutionary stages that we have, um, it fits for their time period mm -hmm. because it wasn't until my children were gone and independent that I sort of came to terms with who I really was. Yes. And just to um, get in a mother home and go. And, you, you, your home is wherever you happen to be because you're like a snail, you carry it with you. Yes, I was just saying earlier today that I was mm -hmm. feeling like a turtle without my shell mm -hmm. because uh, <laughs> I left the motor home in Arizona this mm -hmm. time. It's the first time I've been without it in 15 years. So it's, it's an odd feeling. <laughs> uh, we have friends in Greenville, Illinois. I, you know, I'll be going there in a few days. Uh, the first time I went there, they had a gypsy loan. They wanted to arrest me. Did you ever run into things like that? <laughs> I haven't run into that. Um, I'm really guided, I, and I just well, I so was really, I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you needed you needed to probably get that law off the books for them. I did. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, I I tend to end up um, where I need to go in order to be to be supported and in order to support. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't run into any gypsy laws. I don't I don't think I'd like that. I'd be I would. I'd feel very um, confronted. Yeah, it, it was. I've me. been called many things, but never that. And it got real scary. I don't mind the the, the labeling of gypsy. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of connotations that go along with it. And I, I sometimes refer to myself as a gypsy without a band, mm -hmm. you That's know, right, because yeah. I, I do carry my house with me. And there is a loose... Um, connection between all the people that are on the road, whether mm -hmm. they're single women, married women, couples, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever they are, there's a, there's a loose connection um, between them, and that's part of what the Infinite Adventures Ministry is about. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't mind the terminology gypsy, but if they have a law against it, then that would bother mm -hmm. me. I think I'd probably have to change myself to maybe an evangelist or something so I'd fit in. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was incredible, but in the meantime, this, this little town has grown and uh, it just made so many changes yeah. and so I don't mind having had that experience you know by to help them grow the, yeah <laughs> help them grow and yeah. looking at the end result um, let's see you we, you have so many stones here and we don't have to touch them but I'm interested in I believe it's this one what is this the the black mm -hmm. that this is um, silicium carbide and it's actually of the stones that are there it's um, there's only 
two that are out there that are um, touched by man in any way, and silicium carbide is one of those. And uh, some of the stones, when stones are, are treated in some way, mm -hmm. a lot of the purists just go, oh, I don't want to deal with that one. That one's been messed with. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's bad or whatever. Um, but a lot of the stones, when they're treated, they act a lot better mm -hmm. than they would, you know, they do different things. Uh, silicium carbide helps the body to fend against or create um, antibodies against carcinogens that are petrochemical based. Oh so things that uh, people who live near airports, people mm -hmm. who live near freeways, that kind of, those kind of environments are usually really attracted to that stone. How incredible. Yeah, well, I could see when you know the stones, you could just tell a story. Yeah. You know, because yeah. We, we use these different tools. Yeah, and every one of them, I mean, they, for example, the um, titanium quartz. Mm -hmm. um, titanium by itself is a white powder. Um, mm -hmm. It's very soft. Um, before it's been, you know, had anything done to it. It's extremely strong once it's been melded together, but um, by itself it's sort of a white powder and it, it's nondescript, it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. And quartz, of course, we all know what it looks like. It looks like the light there. But when you put the two together, when you mm -hmm. put quartz and titanium together, the energy of it has to do with um, allowing spirit to function through you and staying with that higher self connection all the time. Wow. And quartz by itself doesn't do that. Quartz by itself is an amplifier. Mm -hmm. Titanium by itself provides strength. But the two, when they're monatomically bonded, mm -hmm. do a whole different thing. On so. my last trip, somebody gave me, uh, they, uh, you can correct me if I'm not saying this right, it's called a tectite. A tectite, yes. Yeah, and it was... Uh, the energy was almost too much for me, even though I keep my I sleep with the media right sometimes. <laughs> but it was so intense. Some of the small ones are quite intense. Moldavite, mm -hmm. which I don't have a piece out there. I, I didn't remember to put out a piece. Mm -hmm. um, but Moldavite from Czechoslovakia, which mm -hmm. was um, often referred to as the green stone that fell from the heavens mm -hmm. in the search for the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail story. Um, that's a very powerful um, meteorite. Yeah. Meteorite stone. They just put out so many different things. Um, do you have any experiences you'd like to share? Something that you... Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> there are many and varied. And um, I, I, let's see, one that you might find to be interesting as far as the creation of the jewelry is concerned. Okay. And that was strange also. Mm -hmm. um, coming, f I drive between the Northwest and um, Arizona every year and one year I, I usually go from um, Reno to uh, Las Vegas in like one swoop it's a mm -hmm. long stretch but I do yeah. that all at one time and I started late out of Reno one afternoon and so I didn't get all the way I got somewhere in between and um, got really tired I was just really yeah. exhausted and so I pulled over because of course I'm carrying my house with me yeah. <laughs> so I pulled over to take a nap and woke up re and realized that I must have been a lot tireder than I thought because I'd left the headlights on. I... So I had no battery, no engine battery. Mm -hmm. My house batteries were fine, yeah. but no engine battery. And um, so I thought, oh, well, you know, if I turn it off, usually this happens. You turn the lights off and, mm -hmm. you know, give it a few hours and it'll charge itself up and you'll yeah. be fine. Anyway, that's what I did. And so I thought, well, I'll make jewelry because it was already nighttime, and so I thought, well, I can work in the motorhome. I have lights and everything in there. So I started working in the motorhome, and I pull in energies from around me as I'm mm -hmm. working. I sort of set a feel, and I pull in energies from that feel, and that's, that's how I create my jewelry. And so I had set my space, and I was pulling in, and something shifted. Mm -hmm. You know, like the third piece of jewelry in, something just kind of, there was a, a glitch. Yeah. So, you know, like they talk about in Matrix, it was a glitch yeah. <laughs> in the program. And I went, oh, what was that? And it felt strange enough that I thought, well, maybe I'm just going to take a peek outside. Because you know, you're in your little house. It's, you know. And oh. so I turned out the lights and I looked outside and there was no outside. There was, there. I saw no lights anywhere. And I was in um, a rest area that was inside of a town. Mm -hmm. So there were lights outside. There were supposed to be lights. There were supposed to be houses. There was supposed to be a gas station across the street. There was a street light. I mean, there were supposed to be things out there. Mm -hmm. And I turned off my lights, and I looked outside, and there, wasn't, there were no lights at all. 
And so I opened the window and I thought, this is really odd. There was nothing out there that I could tell. And then I got scared. <laughs> and so I closed the window and I was just kind of sitting there going, oh boy. I don't know what's going on. I flandered to <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going on, and I'm not sure if I want to know. Yeah. And the, it, this, I don't know how long this lasted, j maybe just a few minutes, mm -hmm. maybe longer. But I, d I was afraid to turn my lights back on because it was like, if there are no lights out there, then that means I'm going to shine like a beacon. That's right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if I want to shine like a yeah. beacon. So I didn't turn my lights back on. And it was very interesting. I just sat there in the dark, and I thought, OK, you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And, and I'll just be here. Mm -hmm. And then I felt another glitch, you know, just a, a, like a, a, a skip. Yeah. You know, that's what it sort of felt like. And I thought, now I wonder. And I opened, peeked out, and there were lights again. Lights on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I continued to work the rest of that evening. And then I went to sleep, and I thought, I've got to ask these people about these power outages they're having yeah. here. Because that's, I mean, that's what my mind made it yeah. to. It was like, it, it was a power outage. And so the next day, when I got up, I went across the street to get, um, food, you know, mm -hmm. get coffee and just, you know, and, and to ask. I mean, that was my main reason. Yeah. And I said, you know, do you guys have um, blackouts very often? And they said, no. blackout. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, didn't you guys lose power last night? And they said, no. No. Yeah, that happens to me all the okay. time. Okay. <laughs> you see, yeah. like I was in Sturgis. Uh, I thought I was in Sturgis. And uh, I was in... Yeah, and then uh, then we left there. I made a phone call, and uh, there were three phones, and the, the times were different than mine. So I said to the lady, do you have a power outage often? Yeah, and, and they she have says, no clue. Well, no, we open 24 hours, and so because we sometimes we do jump in and out of time like that. Yeah, and uh, and so when we left there, um, I had a gentleman with me named David Sharkey, and. Um, so this, this young couple came and they were all upset. They said they had gotten caught in this tornado. And the woman was very, very pregnant. And so uh, been, been having delivered some babies, uh, I checked and she was fine. Then we got to this little town and it was a beautiful Isn't it day. Isn't always the little towns? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a beautiful day and we went to the station and I got the feeling that I was in a movie, The Stanford Wives. It's like oh, no. all these people, <laughs> everything was moving kind of oddly. Uh -huh. So I didn't like it there. So we went maybe 10 miles down the road mm -hmm. and it turned out that the little town I had just, we had just left was Spencer, uh, South Dakota. Um, Sturgis is in South Dakota, no? I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, I haven't done any yes, traveling up that way. Okay. Yeah. And um, so what happened is they, they had, when we got to the other side of that, the, the tornado these young people had told us about had actually occurred, except that when I arrived, when we arrived there, it was really after the tornado, except we arrived there before the tornado. Right. Flipped little, it little and came back travel. later. Yeah. It was incredible. So, but when we out there in the middle of nowhere, we do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the fun. Yeah. But it, it, it gets those. <laughs> it does. Say. And the interesting thing about mm -hmm. the jewelry that I made that night, every person that ended up, I bought, I made five pieces that night and every mm -hmm. person that ended up purchasing those pieces had also had um, glitches Time in travels. their life. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason that they were attracted to the piece of jewelry. When I told yeah. them the story of you know what had happened when their piece of jewelry mm -hmm. was being made, they were they totally identified with it. And it yeah. made sense. Normally, if a person picks out a piece of jewelry and says, I really like this piece, mm -hmm. I can give them some information about themselves. Yeah. Um, with those pieces of jewelry, the information didn't seem to fit the person until that time thing was put into it, and then That's it fit. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very, very interesting. So it had a lot more to do with how the piece was created than it did what the piece was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you can see, I wear a, a watch with two times. So you can so I keep get up. lost twice. <laughs> yeah. So do you you find? Um, you, you I, I don't, don't do watch. watches at all. Okay. I don't do watches. Mm -hmm. at all. They they quit working. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the more that I have lived this way, the more mm -hmm. um, I sort of have this built-in clock. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter how tired I am. 
um, how little sleep I've gotten, whatever. If I tell myself when I close my eyes, mm -hmm. I'm going to wake up in 15 minutes, then I'll wake up in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. If I tell myself I'm going to wake up in two hours, I'll wake up in mm -hmm. two hours. So I just don't, I don't do the clocks anymore. There's one yeah. in the car and there's one mm -hmm. in the motorhome, but as far as wearing one on my body, <laughs> yeah, mine stopped too, but I've been really happy with these two. Now, uh, a little earlier before we got, um, because he eventually we're going to lead up to something else, you mentioned uh, 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 the cleansing of the jewelry. Yes. Maybe you'd like to explain that? Um, well, first of all, um, jewelry carries a, it carries the resonance of the wearer. The metals pick up a um, vibrational signature mm -hmm. from the wearer and um, it's one of the reasons that the crown jewels are so valued it's yes they value them because they're expensive um, mm -hmm. stones and metals and whatnot but what they value more is the energy of all the rulers in the past that have worn those and the mm -hmm. things that they've gone through as they've been wearing those though you know those those pieces yeah. of jewelry um, in the case of your your ring I was I you said something about you didn't you used to have a lot of jewelry and you wore a lot of jewelry and then and yeah. you sort of put it away. Became and a different person. Exactly, wasn't and important. wasn't attracted mm -hmm. to it anymore. And what I was saying to you is when we wear jewelry, it has a twofold purpose, at least twofold, mm -hmm. maybe many more. But uh, its main purpose, aside from uh, being an adornment and looking pretty and having a symbology to us, like mm -hmm. a wedding ring or, you know, a, a, a graduation ring or that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Beyond that, its purpose is whatever that the energy of that stone is and whatever the energy of that metal is, mm -hmm. those pieces create a, an energy field for us. And they do that, for example, with diamonds and gold. Diamonds are a carbon-based mineral, mm -hmm. and their purpose specifically is to filter negativity. So they act as a screen. Oh, and cool. That's, I didn't that's know that. their job. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Once they have done that for so long mm -hmm. and they haven't been cleansed, they're not able to do that anymore. If you're reasonably intuitive, you tend to take that piece of jewelry off because it's all gunked up. You don't know that mm -hmm. consciously, but your body says, I don't want this on me anymore. You know, it's not doing what it's supposed to and it can't do anymore. Got a few and filters doesn't... here, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it did. They need diamonds need to be mm -hmm. cleansed on a really regular basis. The whole story with the Hope Diamond, mm -hmm. if they would take that poor little thing out of that case, Mm -hmm. and cleanse it, it wouldn't have its whole history of, you know, being bad luck and having that's a curse right. on it and all of that. Mm -hmm. All of that has to do with energy that's kind of stuck to it because of things that have happened around it that it has filtered. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I tell people to cleanse their jewelry, basically there's a couple of um, easy ways to do it, mm -hmm. and I can go into those now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, pen came I up. Tell if, uh, my, pen. My, my pen here. I always <laughs> interrupt people with my pen. No, uh, what I was going to have you clarify, cleaning and cleansing is two different things. Exactly. That's what I wanted to yes. in interfere with you Cleaning here. has to do with making it look shiny and pretty. Mm -hmm. And so you can do that with toothpaste and a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, with diamonds and whatnot, you can throw them in the Sonic with that little liquid junk and leave them in there for a half an hour and take them out right. and they're sparkly mm -hmm. and they look pretty. Energetically, they're still dirty. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, energetic cleansing of your stones is a whole different thing. Some books have been written that tell people to put their stones in salt. I go like this and I go, please mm -hmm. don't do that. You know, it's, it's um, probably one of the harshest things that you can do to mm -hmm. any stone. Salt is um, overly cleansing. It takes mm -hmm. everything out and so the stone needs to be re-energized again in order for it to function properly. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to cleanse stones if you're doing your jewelry on a real regular basis is just to get water from a free running source, mm -hmm. a river, a lake, a stream, rainwater, put it in a glass dish, mm -hmm. a clear glass dish preferably, and cover it, you know, enough water so that mm -hmm. it will cover the jewelry, put the jewelry in it, leave it in there overnight, take it out, then you can throw it in the Sonic if you want. Mm -hmm. um, then it's cleansed energetically and physically, and you can toss the water. Mm -hmm. Now if you've used a stone or a piece of jewelry, if you've worn a piece of jewelry through a traumatic event, mm -hmm. you know, something really bad has happened, a divorce, um, an injury, you, you were hurt mm -hmm. and, you know, you wore the piece of jewelry the whole time that you were healing, that kind of thing, then it's going to need a deeper cleansing. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to do that is to bury it. Put it in cheesecloth. Um, dig a hole in your backyard, mm -hmm. put it in the hole, mark the spot because your backyard gets really big as soon as you put something in it. 
<laughs> so you mark the spot oh, and yeah. leave it there for at least 72 hours. What it does is it returns the stone to the resonance of the earth, which is where it came from. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so then they're ready to come out and do their work again. Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing how people will have put jewelry away and not worn it for years, mm -hmm. not know that it's been cleansed, but if it's been cleansed and it's sitting out where they can see it, they'll pick it up and wear it. Yeah, well, let's, let's see. Uh, I have a medicine staff, and I charged that at Thunder Mountain, Colorado, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I had it in the. Uh, somebody cleansed it for me because right. I didn't know all that. I could have buried it myself. Yes, yeah. And then charged it with sunlight. Yes, mm -hmm. sunlight. Or and if you if you've done the salt thing, if people, you know, mm -hmm. if the friends out there have done the salt thing, where they put their stones in salt to cleanse them because they read that in some book somewhere, you can recharge the stones and get them back up to full operating capacity mm -hmm. by leaving them outside and letting them run through a full cycle of the moon from from full to full or from new to new, but they mm -hmm. need to run through a full 28 days uh, of moon cycle, sun and moon outside, and they'll, they'll be charged back up again. But that's such a, you're without your crystals for that's at least 28 hard, yeah. days. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to put them in rainwater or bury them for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. But I can really see the wisdom in that because, as you know, we have other mutual friends uh, up in the Seattle area, and sometimes we do psychometry. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And then people give you jewelry, and usually I pick up the original owner. Exactly, and that's because it hasn't been cleansed. It hasn't been cleansed. If it's yeah. been cleansed, you would not be able to pick up the original owner. Mm -hmm. You would only be able to pick up the person who wore it most recently. Yeah, and so sometimes you have to say, now, I don't know, is this yours or solely yours? And then people don't understand the importance because I will pick up the original owner. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did a reading on a watch once mm -hmm. um, that was at that group. There's a group mm -hmm. that we do in Seattle that um, yeah. they, they showcase. And there was a, an old watch that was in in the group, mm -hmm. but it was um, it was in like a cloth, so I couldn't really see it. Yeah. Um, but I picked it up and I was doing a reading on it, and I got like a, a boat trip in a very old boat, and I got a train ride, and I got hard work, yeah. and I got all this stuff, mm -hmm. and then I got something real modern that was like computers and whatnot, and I couldn't I couldn't quite put it all together yeah. you know these pictures come and then when we were doing the reading for the person it was a watch that he had gotten from his great grandfather and he had brought it from the old country he had come by boat and then he had gone across yeah, yeah. so it was it was yeah. quite fascinating the whole story was in that watch in because that it had watch. never been cleansed mm -hmm. now I was at the Adam Center up in Anchorage one time mm -hmm. and we did psychometry and put it all in one basket and here again they had interconnected and oh the my. same thing happened Oh, so uh, you were getting everybody's everybody, stuff? Everybody, I got the cracked trifle for this lady and the spill cream of weed for this lady. Oh, my. And then we realized <laughs> they were all interconnected. Oh, that's so kind of cool. Now I do keys. Yes. It's easier for me to do keys. Keys, keys mm -hmm. are interesting. Sometimes keys are really good, and sometimes for me they're very confusing because mm -hmm. people carry such a strange energy usually when they're dealing with their keys. You know, because they're in a hurry or they're unlocking a door. Or they're, mm -hmm. So they carry a different kind of energy than they do when they're just hanging out. Yeah. Now, it just occurred to me, some of the friends might not know what psychometry is. Could we explain that? Sure. Um, psychometry, as I understand it, is mm -hmm. holding an object mm -hmm. and doing a reading based on the information that you get from holding the object. The object. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you get, some people get pictures, some people get whole stories, some people That's hear right. sound. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, um, I will feel which is a clarisentient part, I will get a feeling in my body, mm -hmm. usually about physical ailments or whatever that the person has. Mm -hmm. So if I'm holding something that belongs to someone who has arthritis, mm -hmm. then suddenly I'll get achy joints, mm -hmm. you know, for the length of time that I'm holding it. As soon as I put it down, it goes away. Yeah, okay, and let's see, what else? Um, where do you see yourself five years from now? Five years from now, um, I see myself with a pro five years. That's a long time. I, I, there's some stuff in between there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I see myself continuing to travel. Mm -hmm. um, but I also see myself with a radio show and a show like yours. I, I, you're an inspiration to me as far as that is concerned. And working on doing one of those in uh, the Arizona area in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, also, I should have at least another one more book out and hopefully two um there's one that's in the cooker that's not quite done mm -hmm. um and then there's another one that's has been started but there's a long ways to go before it's finished so i i hope to have both of those out um and continuing to do my work um there's there's so much to be done as far as teaching um 
giving people the information about the gemstones mm -hmm. and whatnot, but also carrying the energy as I go. I travel the planet and at first I used to try to do ceremony in an area, you know, or I would try to take crystals and put them there and, it's, and it became too contrived for me. Mm -hmm. And I got in a dream that it's all I needed to do was show up. Thank you. That's one That's of my favorites. That's all I needed to do. Uh, I just, just needed to go up. there. And mm -hmm. my placing myself in the energy grid, wherever it was on the planet, was what made the difference. This is a wonderful yeah. bridge uh, for me to go to this other subject. We, that sort of dear to our heart. Okay. But I'd like to explain to the friends that when we're clairvoyant or whatever, um, sometimes it takes us places because we have learned how to follow our guidance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see wonderful things, and sometimes we see things that's not so good. Yeah. And um, the second part of the show today deals with one of the subjects that is dear to your heart, because in a way we are observers. Yes. Sometimes we speak up and then give it up and let the next person come and fix it if they can. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to sort of go into the second part of the show. Would you like to f tell the friends what your main concern and your main, maybe not your main focus, but the reason you, we really doing this show. The reason today. we ended up connecting? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the fact that I was driving down the road holding the steering wheel with one hand and the cell phone with the other and frantically dialing everyone that was in my phone, um, trying to get them on a prayer circle. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. That had to do with the, um, the southern border of the U.S., between the U.S. and Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, there's a group there that's called mm -hmm. the Citizens for Border Solutions. Now, dearest to my heart, mm -hmm. oh. I, I, <laughs> let me, I have to interrupt you here. I didn't know we was going to go into the whole story because one of the things we need to do, I believe it's important that our, our Spanish-speaking friends understand exactly what you're telling them. Okay. And so, therefore, I'm going to ask... Um, my, our good friend uh, Bernie uh, Salazar to come and translate that part because I would like for everybody to understand what that means. So if we could get a Bernie here, please. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to explain, you know, translate what you say. And okay. while Bernie is coming on, I'm going to show you a, um, <laughs> a picture of Bernie here. He's yeah. also one of our producers here. And the name of your show, Bernie? Oh, it, it's kind of hard to say, but it's Reino de Estrellas. But you did me. I couldn't have said <laughs> it at all. It, it's Star Rain. It's uh, mm -hmm. because I believe most of us are, are like a little twinkling star, uh, some in, in some way. In some way. So, uh, um, my shows uh, mainly geared towards Latin people, uh, mm -hmm. Hispanic-speaking uh, people, and um, I hope we're trying to do a little bit in the community. Yeah, we are going to do that. And so I, he also, our audio person here for the friends that want to meet the staff. Now, I'm, what we want to do, this is Bernie Shalasar, by the way. Hello. Hi. And so if you'd be nice enough to tell the story so Bernie can translate it for the friends. Okay. Um, when I was on my way to mm -hmm. the Northwest, um, I got a call from my friends in Arizona. Mm -hmm. saying that the U.S. Do I need to? No. Okay. Well, you know, uh, or, or maybe you can say it, and I say it, and if it doesn't bother you, I say it in Spanish. Uh, okay. While you're that talking. works for me. Sure. So I, I think I, I've had that done before. If it makes really? me crazy, I'll tell you. I know. <laughs> it makes me crazy. It goes to craziness. Okay. I don't know how they want to handle that. I'm out of it. Okay. Cuando ella dice, cuando yo iba en... en por donde vivía. Entonces, alguien me llamó. And just... Oh, okay, keep going. Yeah. Okay, um, so anyway, as I was coming up, they called me and said that there was a me problem on the border, that um, the people en, were, en el paso. the ranchers were getting, que los, uh, um, los rancheros ahí getting <sighs> agitated. And they were bringing people in from California to help them um, fight the people, the Mexican nationals who were coming across the border. The propaganda that has been put out about the Mexican nationals coming across the border um, has been that they are bad people, they are running drugs, they are... Um, 
vandalizing the ranches. Que están they are basically not to the benefit of Americans, and they're also taking away American jobs, and etc., etc. That's the propaganda. El a los, a los um, the truth is that the people who are coming across the border are Mexican nationals <laughs> who have family already in the U.S. Aquí. They are not coming in to get on to our welfare rolls. They don't have a green no, card, no so they can't apply anyway. No um, the only reason that they would go to y a house is if they're thirsty al, or they're hungry. Si they're not throwing sed. away garbage in the desert, which no is part of the things that they're mm -hmm. saying they're doing, because they, they need everything they have to get Porque to where they're going. You know, they're not going to leave their water bottle. They may need water la later. La this is this is ridiculous. Um, they're not accosting people. They certainly aren't killing cattle. If they kill a cow, I'm sure they'd eat it. They wouldn't leave it lying there. Um, they are not running drugs. They're just moving themselves from Mexico into the U.S. Yes, a lot of them are coming in without green cards. They have come across that border without green cards for a couple of hundred years. And it, there hasn't been a problem until now. And it's still not a problem to the majority of the people who live in the southern part of Arizona. It has been made to look like a problem. And the reason that I think that they're making it look like a problem is so that they can bring in more border patrol, so that they can create more law enforcement in the area. Um, it doesn't support life. It doesn't support the life of the people who live in the area. It doesn't support the Mexican nationals. And there's a lot of talk about the financial benefits of the Mexican nationals coming across. And if the economy was better in Mexico, then it would be better. You know, they wouldn't come across and etc. I don't think that that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem has to do with the fact that we have drawn a line es que between that country and this country and said, You're de, de you have to stay over Estados there, Unidos you're the underprivileged, we're the privileged, we live on this side of the line. In order to come over here, you need our permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a little ball of dirt that we live on. Yeah. And we all have to learn how to play nice in the sandbox. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, with that thought in mind, knowing that the Mexican nationals were coming across the border without food, without water, that were being taken advantage of by the coyotes, the people that they have to pay to get them across, who would then point to lights and tell them that they were in you know, Phoenix when they were actually two miles from the border. Um, we set up a prayer circle that would facilitate their safe passage. Um, after a while, you can, only, you can only do so much physically. Um, we've given them water, we've given them food, we've hidden them, we've done everything that we could physically to facilitate them. But according to the U.S. law, we are breaking the law. We're not supposed to feed them. We're not supposed to speak to them. We're not supposed to do a whole lot of things. They have this whole list. But at the same time, the U.S. law says that we're not supposed to ask. It's not our right, because our job is not immigration. It's not our right to ask them you know, what their nationality is, whether or not they have a passport. So we're in a catch-22. So we took it to mm -hmm. spirit, because es que there's nothing else. That's right, yes. It's so it, we took it to God. It reminds me of uh, uh, the, the Underground Railroad. It's the same thing. It's just a different group of people. Mm -hmm. And in, with uh, those laws, los, uh, eventually what happened, um, because people got convicted, los we did a show on jury nullification, los, uh, where we used to ask that law as a, for instance, that if enough people speak up, they have to change the law and make some changes. Exactly. So that's another way we can sort of... Yeah. Well, we were, we were doing a stopgap right then because there were meetings scheduled every day, every hour just about, for like four days. And the impetus was to get the National Guard to assist the ranchers in detaining the, the Mexican nationals. And we didn't want that. I mean, we'd have another Ken State. And that's what we were afraid of.
when I spoke to you, um, I was under the impression that had happened already. And the reason is because the next day it was on the national news that, not quite the way you told it, but uh, all they said was that um, the, the farmers are not vigilantes, so they cleaned it up a lot. Oh, yeah. They, and that had been the problem. That was the reason that I was very pleased to be able to come on your show. Because what has been the propaganda that has been put out is that the farmers are protecting their land, that these people are protecting themselves against these bad Mexican people that are coming across the border. And that's not the case. They don't need to protect themselves against people, women traveling with babies in their arms. What is to protect themselves from. So the meetings, have, they, um, have these meetings buffered the effect a little bit? Yes, or it are has. They still it was helping? absolutely wonderful. So, um, mm -hmm. it, we still need the prayers, and the prayers is that the, that the border will go away, okay, at this point. Mm -hmm. But yes, the, the prayer circle that we did at that mm -hmm. time, um, the meetings fell flat. It was, I kept calling to find out, you know, what was going on and how the meetings were working. And I guess the first day they came in and they had all of these um, disruptor people in from California and they were trying to incite the people and get them angry and, and whatnot. And it just, it just it was like a, a balloon with the air let out. It just, it just fell and it didn't work. And then the next meeting they, it was, you know, they tried again to get everybody riled up. It didn't work. Um, and then they they went to the, the mayor or the governor and asked to bring in the National Guard, and they said absolutely not. It was not a state of emergency, and they wouldn't do it. So the prayers do work. Well, we did another show about Arizona where we talked about the, um, the Four Corner area and the rights of the, of the Native Americans mm -hmm. there. So I think the um, Arizona itself uh, is going to probably not make as much noise as they would like to because they have all these different issues. They do, and, and there's a lot of things happening there. We wanted to get this issue to the national attention, the other side of the issue, you know, the, the, the side of the Mexican nationals, um, as opposed to the side of the ranchers. And it's not so much a matter of polarizing the groups and saying, these are the ranchers, these are the nationals, because we're all just human. We're all people. And the idea is that humanity needs to be supported. And so so as long as there's a haves and a have-nots, you know, the border says that these people have to stay here and these have to stay here, as long as that delineation is there, there's going to be a problem. So the idea is to get rid of the delineation. And a lot of people have trouble wrapping their mind around that. They, you know, what will happen? All of those people will come here. No, they won't. I'd like to go there. You know, it would just open it up so that people can move freely throughout the planet. Cutting it up into little vines, little boxes, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. There are resources that Mexico has that we could use. There are resources that we have that they could use. Why is it that there has to be an us and a them? There is a tremendous amount of number of Mexican nationals in the, in the federal prisons on mm -hmm. drug charges because they were refused payment when the work was over. Exactly. And that is something that has happened also here in, in Washington even. Um, I don't know if it's happening now, but a few years back, the Mexican nationals would be allowed to get all the way here. That's right pick the fruit or the vegetables or whatever it was that they were hired to do, once the entire harvest was in, just before they were to be paid, they would call immigration, and then they would send them home as illegal immigrants and not pay them. That's right, and incarcerate them. That's yeah, what and that's, that's unfair. And, um, my problem with with that as well as uh, the, I have a Como huge problem with all of it. <laughs> but um, when I see es que the, the U.S. government asking U.S. citizens to turn their head away from someone who is hungry, someone who needs water, um, someone who is cold, someone who needs shelter, um, and asking us to not see that, to, to look the other way or to call the Border Patrol and report these people, my response is, 
How would you want American citizens to be treated in another country? Do you want them to be turned away? Do you want them to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be sick, to be any of those things and not be able to go to a fellow human being and ask for assistance? And I, just, I think that the Americans should not be put in that, that position. I, I totally agree. I don't think Americans as a whole can comprehend what that means because they we don't have, have any idea. We have no idea had these problems before. Unless we've traveled outside of the U.S., um, I don't think that most Americans, and I was talking to a military man, I was hiking um, in, in Arizona, down in the near the Huachucas, where these people are coming through, and there was a group of nationals, a baby, and um, four adults, and they were hiding because the border patrol was, you know, cruising the area, and these military guys from Fort Huachuca had seen them, and they were chattering away about how they were going to call the border patrol to pick them up. And my response, I turned and I said. You, above Pero everyone si else in this area, stands the highest chance of being caught behind enemy lines mm -hmm. and not having También a friend. How dare you? Mm -hmm. You know, and they didn't get it. They really didn't get it. And it, it makes me, it makes me really emotional to, um, to see us training our military to be inhumane and expecting our citizens to be inhumane to another group of people just because they look different, they have different beliefs, um, they don't have the same appearance that we do, and they weren't fortunate enough to be born on this side of the border. Yeah. That's unfair. So you're going to continue with the prayers? Yes, we want the prayers to continue. Um, we're, we're looking at the border as being bathed in green light um, for two reasons. One is that green is the opposite of red, which is the color for war. Green is the opposite of that color, so it, it um, represents peace. But also green is the color of healing. And we want to heal that, that wound because I look at the border as a wound. It's like a cut that's been made on the planet. And so we're bathing that area in green light to heal the rift between those two countries, the U.S. and Mexico. Um, I don't think the rift is between the peoples of the two countries. I think it has to do with the governments and the powers that be that stand for separation. The people stand for unity. They stand for togetherness. And so, yeah, the prayers are continuing. And I think they probably need to continue until that border isn't there anymore. And I really I think that that can be. The border is down between, the Berlin Wall is down, and I think the wall can be down. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you have a web page that will be shown at the end of the show? I have my own web page, and um, there will be links from my web page to the web page for the Citizens for Border Solutions, which is the name of the group. There is also a um, another group that is in Mexico, or in, in the Southwest, um, that I would like to have people know about, um, and they can catch that from my web page as well. And that one has to do with, um, it has a number for the Mexican nationals to be able to call if they are apprehended by Border Patrol. Because if you don't speak the language and you're in a strange place, you don't know what your rights are. You don't know what these people are stopping you for. Um, when the coyotes let them off, they tell them that they're in Phoenix and that they're, they're safe. You know, so they don't know anything. This now, there's a phone number for them to call that will give them um, assistance, legal assistance, and um, information about what this strange country that they've landed in is, is about. Is it in English or is it bilingual? The phone number, it, they, that, the phone number will be given in Spanish and English. Um, the information on my web page will be put in Spanish and English so that they can click on it and go to the Los Hermanos. Oh, I can't en, say it in Spanish. It means the f the the friends. Los amigos. Los no. no. It sounds like hermanos, but it's something else. Amistad. 
Oh, I don't know. Hermandad. Um, say that again. Hermandad. What does that mean? Uh, like brotherhood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a group out of Tucson, and they have legal oh, representation um, for the Mexican nationals, and there's a number that they can call. Hopefully, now the number is manned 24 hours a day. At one time, there was a machine on it which said, we'll call you back. And if you're a Mexican mm. national with one quarter, that Hace doesn't help. <laughs> so you need volunteers also. Yes, they need volunteers. Um, they need, we need help getting our, the, the CBS mm -hmm. webpage up so mm -hmm. that people can get from my webpage to that mm -hmm. webpage and to the, the rest of the information. Mm -hmm. There's a, in the last, the prayers, like I said, has done tremendous. It has been on um, public broadcast mm -hmm. radio for um, the Mexican music station. Mm -hmm. That there was a whole expose on there that was very unbiased, very just fact giving. Esta información um, también está en los radios so it's it, the, the, it is helping to get the word out si es que and as far as what we need in order to make mm -hmm. um, CBS work better, we need we need. Volunteers. <laughs> volunteers. We need volunteers. I'm going to inject something here. I need to thank you, Bernie. Thank you. You're welcome. Alea, we're out of time. Uh, uh -huh. You come back in your motorhome the next time. Thank you for being the loving, caring beings that you both are. And um, <laughs> for, for the friends, some look in your heart and see how you feel about the whole subject. And I guess we'll see you next week. Bye. Nos vemos dentro de poco. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't want to fast. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs>